Hello, my friends. I'm really excited to announce that starting today, I will be embarking on a new read-along project, which I hope to share with you. It's a read-along project of the education of Henry Adams by none other than Henry Adams. It's an autobiography, the autobiography of Henry Adams. And hopefully over the coming weeks, I will be producing videos, making videos uh, as I work my way through this book. It's not the first time uh, reading the book, but it's a reread and it's a reread that I hope to share with you. Henry Adams was born in Boston in 1838 and he died in 1918. He was part of a very famous American family, the Adams family. Uh, his grandfather and his great-grandfather were both U.S. presidents, John Adams and John Quincy Adams. Henry Adams himself was a historian and a journalist. He wrote books of history in his lifetime, and he also served as a secretary to his father, who was an ambassador to the United Kingdom. But over the course of Henry Adams' life, the world changed dramatically. Uh, of course, he lived through and worked through the Civil War. Um, but technologically speaking, the world into which he was born was unrecognizably different from the world in which he died. And that's really what this book, I think, is about. It's about a reckoning, a coming to terms, a trying to make sense of modernity and the drama and the change that the world is undergoing. So just to give a sense of what I mean, this book, The Education of Henry Adams, is being written and published for the first time in the beginning of the 20th century, in the early 1900s, like 1907. And Henry Adams, being born in 1838, lived most of his life uh, in the 1800s. And over the course of that time period of 80 or so years, you, we moved as, as a world, as a society, as a country, from a pre-modern to a modern world. The telephone was invented in 1876. The light bulb was invented in 1879. Gasoline-powered cars were invented in 1892. And so at this time period where Henry Adams is writing, the world that he's taking in is a world of increasing industrialization and increasing power, increasing electricity and coal electrification. Technology is, is exploding in ways um, that have really never been seen before uh, throughout human history. And so Henry Adams, the historian, is trying to make sense of this. He's trying to write down uh, how do we uh, grapple, how do we understand our current moment? What does it mean? In the next video, we're going to talk a little bit about the title of the book, The Education of Henry Adams. What is education in this book? Why is it called that? And what is the education that Henry Adams is looking for? When I searched for the word education in the Project Gutenberg digital uh, file, for the education of Henry Adams. The word education appears 514 times, so it's a real obsession of the book. But what exactly that means, uh, we're going to hold off on that question for now. Um, instead, I like to just sort of start off this read-along um, by just sort of cracking open the book and getting a sense of, of his style and how he invites the reader in. So, chapter one, Quincy, 1838 to 1848. Under the shadow of Boston State House, turning its back on the house of John Hancock, the little passage called Hancock Avenue runs, or ran, from Beacon Street, skirting the State House grounds to Mount Vernon Street, on the summit of Beacon Hill. And there, in the third house below Mount Vernon Place, February 16, 1838, a child was born, and christened later by his uncle, the minister of the First Church, after the tenants of Boston Unitarianism as Henry Brooks Adams. Had he been born in Jerusalem under the shadow of the temple and circumcised in the synagogue by his uncle the high priest under the name of Israel Cohen, he would scarcely have been more distinctly branded and not much more heavily handicapped in the races of the coming century in running for such stakes as the century was to offer. Skipping a bit, what could become of such a child of the 17th and 18th centuries when he should wake up to find himself required to play the game of the 20th? Had he been consulted, would he have cared to play the game at all, holding such cards as he held and suspecting that the game was to be one of which neither he nor anyone else back to the beginning of time knew the rules or the risks or the stakes? He was not consulted and was not responsible. 
but had he been taken into the confidence of his parents, he would certainly have told them to change nothing as far as concerned him. He would have been astounded by his own luck. Probably no child born in the year held better cards than he. Whether life was an honest game of chance or whether the cards were marked and forced, he could not refuse to play his excellent hand. He could never make the usual plea of irresponsibility. He accepted the situation as though he had been a party to it, and under the same circumstances would do it again, the more readily for knowing the exact values. Skipping a bit. This problem of education, started in 1838, went on for three years while the baby grew, like other babies, unconsciously as a vegetable, the outside world working as it never had worked before to get his new universe ready for him. For him alone, the old universe was thrown into the ash heap and a new one created. He and his 18th century troglodytic Boston were suddenly cut apart, separated forever, in act if not in sentiment, by the opening of the Boston and Albany Railroad, the appearance of the first Cunard steamers in the bay, and the telegraphic messages which carried from Baltimore to Washington the news that Henry Clay and James K. Polk were nominated for the presidency. This was in May 1844. He was six years old. His new world was ready for use, and only fragments of the old met his eyes. End quote. So what you have there is just this you know, beautiful poetic description of being born into a brand new world, of being born to parents, to society, to culture, to customs that are of an older century at a time when uh, the railroad is tearing things apart, the telegraph is changing civilization and society forever. In the book, he describes himself growing up as being smaller and a little more sickly than his peers. And he uh, attributes this, and also his intellectual development to some extent, he attributes to him developing scarlet fever at a young age. So this is from when he's three years old. On December 3rd, 1841, he developed scarlet fever. For several days, he was as good as dead, reviving only under the careful nursing of his family. When he began to recover strength about January 1st, 1842, his hunger must have been stronger than any other pleasure or pain, for while in afterlife he retained not the faintest recollection of his illness, he remembered quite clearly his aunt entering the sick room, bearing in her hand a saucer with a baked apple. And now he describes the effect of uh, having been a sickly child. But this fever of Henry Adams took greater and greater importance in his eyes from the point of view of education the longer he lived. At first, the effect was physical. He fell behind his brothers two or three inches in height and proportionally in bone and weight. His character and processes of mind seemed to share in this fining down process of scale. He was not good in a fight, and his nerves were more delicate than boys' nerves ought to be. He exaggerated these weaknesses as he grew older. The habit of doubt, of distrusting his own judgment, and of totally rejecting the judgment of the world. The tendency to regard every question as open. The hesitation to act except as a choice of evils. The shirking of responsibility. The love of line, form, quality. The horror of ennui. The passion for companionship and the antipathy to society. All these are well-known qualities of New England character, in no way peculiar to individuals, but in this instance they seemed to be stimulated by the fever, and Henry Adams could never make up his mind whether on the whole the change of character was morbid or healthy, good or bad for his purpose. His brothers were the type, he was the variation. And so that's it. Uh, there's a lot to discuss here. Henry Adams is very interested in the role that religion plays um, in this modern world. He reflects on the fact that uh, he, he, he had no patience for religion growing up. He, he was raised into a religious society, but he, he, he marvels at how it sort of just evaporated and dissipated for him and his peers. Over the book hangs the trauma and the horror of the Civil War and, and what that means as a, as a harbinger of the modern world. Uh, of course, Henry Adams doesn't talk about World War I, which was a European affair that takes place after the book was published. Um, but that kind of question, that question of um, the politics and the violence and the war of the modern age very much uh, is, is infused in that book. And, and the sense you get, even from the opening chapters, in addition to his you know, lovely narration style, is this urgency of 
what is happening? How is our world changing? How do we make sense of this world? And the larger question is, what, what is education in general? Um, what are we looking for in education? Um, how do we get educated, both formally and informally, in schooling and through life experience? So these are the wonderful questions that this book explores, and I hope you will uh, join me on this read-along project. Thank you for watching.